So hello everyone, and uh, we are going to start a general introduction on physically based simulation. And in this video, we will describe the fundamental models. This part is describing the basic theoretical notion in all that generality. And uh, we will see in the following videos how we can actually set up concretely some interactive simulation for computer graphics applications in specific cases. So we already saw several approaches of animating and deforming shapes using interactive or procedural approaches. And we saw that uh, keyframe animation is the preferred approach in production. So when physically based simulation is actually needed? First, physically based simulation accurately represents the dynamics of the motion. In other words, it's acceleration with respect to, exter to external and internal constraints. And in particular, uh, everything related to mass and inertia is naturally handled by physics simulation and represent the correct values and momentum with respect to what would happen in the real world. So when we aim at a correct scaling and action-reaction principle, simulation is the natural tool to use. Second is when the object or animation would be too complex or tedious to model by hand or using procedural animation. This is the case when multiple elements are interacting or colliding, for instance a pile of rigid bodies or the hairs of a character, or when the geometry is very complex and need to be correctly animated, like the wrinkles of a garment or the waves of a fluid. So the very general methodology of physically based simulation is always the same. First, you need to describe your system and your degrees of freedom. It can be the positions, the velocity, the orientation, and so on. The state of your system should be known at time t equals zero. And uh, if you are dealing with a continuous material, you should also know the constraint in space as boundary condition. Second, we need to express some laws of evolution and in particular uh, link the evolution of the system to forces and constraints typically using dynamic principles, invariance or conservation laws. Usually this leads to some differential equations. They can be ordinary differential equations in time for particles and rigid objects and partial differential equations in time and space for continuous material. Third, usually we cannot solve this differential equation in a closed form, and we need to discretize them and use numerical and iterative solver. As a general note, the physically based simulation is fundamentally different and somehow even orthogonal to the direct approaches controlling the trajectories at specific keyframes. Here we have a system fully defined at the initial position, And then we let the numerical solution build a space-time trajectory for us. So the positive side is that it allows to model possibly very complex behavior, but it also has a negative side, which is that the trajectory is very hard to control if you want a specific effect. It depends on initial conditions that I use in a numerical solver. So when we are simulating material, we can separate three fundamental models. Modeling the material as particles, modeling it as rigid bodies, or modeling it as a continuous material. And let us first describe the particle-based modeling. Using particles is usually the simplest form of description we can use. A particle is typically described by a position, a velocity, and a mass. Actually, the fundamental quantity associated to a particle should be its position and its linear momentum, P, which is equal to the mass times the velocity. As in general, the linear momentum is a quantity which is preserved through time and along motion for all isolated systems. Then we can look at the evolution principles. One of the most standard ways to express the evolution is the use of the fundamental principle of dynamics, For that, we need the notion of force applied to the particle. And uh, in its general form, the force can depend on the position P, the velocity V, and the time T. And the relations are that the derivative of the position is the velocity, 
and the derivative of the linear momentum is the force F. In most of the case, the mass of the particle is constant a long time, and in this case, we can say that mass times the derivative of the velocity is equal to the force. Note that in some cases uh, where the force are actually not known or hard to express, we can also use other type of relation to express the time evolution. Sometimes we can use the conservation of energy of conservative systems, such as kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to constant. Or we can use the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian of some system, giving access to a representation of potentially complex couple system in reduced coordinates. And finally, we need to solve the system numerically. In the case of particles, we have an ordinary differential equation, often expressed with initial condition, meaning that we know v at time zero and p at time zero. The general idea is that we discretize the time in discrete steps, delta t or h, and we build a discrete numerical solution, pk is equal to p at time tk or p at time k times delta t. There is actually several numerical schemes that can be used to solve such equation. The ideal scheme can actually depend on the properties of the force. But by default, we can use this very simple iterative scheme called the semi-implicit Euler method, which states that uh, v at time k plus 1 is equal to the current velocity v k plus h time the force, and p at the next time step, p k plus 1, is equal to p k, the current position, plus h time the new velocity, v k plus 1, the one that we just computed. So it's rather simple to implement and it works reasonably well for more cases and we will see some details on why in another class later. So okay, the fundamental laws of dynamics for particles are quite easy and particle models have a lot of advantages actually. First, they are simple, simple to implement and simple to control. Particle approaches are efficient to compute And they can generally scale well. Uh, for more complexity, we just add more particles and try to parallelize it if we can. Particles are also very adaptable and versatile model. It's quite actually impressive how much we can simulate only using particles, typically in considering a lot of particles with sparse and close by interactions. All kinds of materials, from rigid bodies to complex deformable models, such as elastic material, but also fluids and gas, can be simulated using a lot of particles. Thanks to their efficiency and very high adaptability, the particle-based models are the dominant approach, actually, to model complex material in computer graphics for interactive applications. You can see here a demonstration of real-time simulation on the GPU proposed by NVIDIA, and all these interactive simulations are actually made with particles models. We can render on top of them some rigid bodies, surface, fluids, but the underlying physical model is made of particles. But of course, particle models are not perfect. As it's a very simple model, it's also the least accurate one. Actually, using particles to model continuous material is a very big simplification and approximation from a physical point of view. It doesn't mean that we cannot have interesting visual results, and uh, we see that it can actually. But it means that if we look at the numerical results of the evolution of the velocity and the position, it may actually not correspond well to the experiment we could do with a real material in the real world. So we should take care that a nice visual result doesn't necessarily mean that it can be considered as a prediction for a real case application. And in the other way around, there is some highly accurate simulation that can be performed in computational physics or applied math, for instance, that can be very precise with respect to the numerical accuracy, but have very poor visual appearance. So at the end, and as a general note, we should take care to precise the type of application, the word simulation, or realism of a simulation doesn't have a unique universal meaning 
So we should keep in mind that it can have different signification depending on the context, from numerical precision, or fidelity with respect to a predictive model, or a rich level of details of its appearance. So we reach the second fundamental model, which is the rigid bodies. So a rigid body is a solid that can be defined as a domain omega of R3. Each point of this solid, Pi, can have a local density of mass, rho at Pi. And the whole point of rigid body simulation is to try to not have to deal directly with all the points Pi of the solid, and its local density of mass, but to have a simpler integral quantities that can fully describe its behavior as a single entity instead of actions applied to all the points pi. So first we can define, for instance, the total mass of the solid, m, which is the integral over all the points pi of the rho. Then we can also define the position of the center of mass, uh, the com, that we call P, which is equal to 1 over the total mass times the integral of the density rho of pi times the position pi. And we also introduce the notation r, describing a relative position of the body with respect to the center of mass, with r is equal to pi minus p. One of the new level of complexity brought by the solid is that it has a fundamentally an orientation which was not necessarily the case for particle model. So even describing a position and the velocity on the rigid body requires some care. Let's see how we can describe a position and the velocity on the rigid body at time t with respect to its original one at time t is equal to zero. So we suppose that the center of mass of the body at time t is described by a position p of t and has a velocity v at time t, which is equal to p prime of t. And the solid also has an orientation, r of t, which can be described as the rotation from its initial frame at time t is equal to zero to the current one. Now we can say that the position pi of t is equal to p of t plus the rotation r of t times r0, with r0 being the initial relative coordinate of the position pi0 at time t is equal to 0. And so r0 is equal to pi0 minus p0. And now if we differentiate this relation, it leads to the correspondence with the velocity. So we have pi prime of t, which is equal to the velocity of the center of mass, v of t, plus r prime of t times r0. So now we see this notion of derivative of a rotation matrix. This is related to the notion of angular velocity, but what is actually the correspondence between this derivative of rotation matrix, r prime, and the angular velocity of the shape? So the angular velocity is actually a 3D vector that somehow gives the instantaneous magnitude and angle of rotation of any point of the solid around its center of mass. So we define the angular velocity omega such that the velocity of a point pi is pi prime of t is equal to the velocity v of t plus omega cross r of t. So omega is the instantaneous rotation of the relative vector r of t. By identification with the previous formula, we have r prime of t times r0 is equal to omega cross r of t, but r of t is equal to the rotation times r0. So at the end, we have the derivative of the rotation matrix times r0 is equal to the cross product between the angular velocity and the rotation times r0. So we would like to simplify this expression as there is r0 on both sides, but there is this cross product. But as we can remember, that a cross product can actually be represented as a matrix, and more precisely by an anti-symmetric matrix of the coordinate of the vector. So we associate to the angular velocity represented as a 3D vector, 
also its matrix representation omega hat, corresponding to its anti-symmetric matrix. Then we have omega cross the rotation times r0 is equal to the matrix product between omega hat times the rotation matrix times r0. And as the equality is true for all r0, we have the equality stating that the derivative of the rotation r prime of t is equal to the angular velocity in its matrix form times the rotation. And this is the relation between the derivative of the rotation matrix and the angular velocity. Applying the angular velocity to the current rotation matrix give you the derivative of this rotation matrix. Now let's see the fundamental quantities associated to the rigid body. There is a part which is actually similar to the single particle. The center of mass of the body has a position P of t and a velocity V of t, which is the derivative of P of t. And we can define the notion of linear momentum, which is preserved from a, for an isolated system. The linear momentum of the rigid body is actually the integral of all its domain of its density of mass times the velocity at its point. But this integral turns out to be simply the total mass of the body times the velocity of its center of mass. And at the end, the linear momentum of a rigid body is equal to the linear momentum of a simple particle positioned at the center of mass. But there is another quantity also which is specific to the rigid body this time. And it's related to its orientation. So we can express the orientation of this shape by a rotation matrix R of t and its angular velocity by omega of t, which is such that the matrix omega hat is equal to the rotation times the rotation transposed. And the second fundamental quantity which is preserved in an isolated system is the angular momentum L of t. And L of t is equal to some matrix I of t times the angular velocity. And I of t is actually called the inertia matrix and we will see in the next slide why it has this representation. What we can see is that the angular momentum has a similarity with the linear momentum. The angular velocity plays the role of the linear velocity and the inertia plays the same role than the mass. So intuitively, the mass can be seen as the resistance of the shape to a change of linear momentum, while the inertia can be seen as the resistance of the shape to a change of angular momentum. And manipulating inertia is however more complex than the mass, as the mass is a single scalar, while the inertia is a matrix, or more precisely it's also called a tensor, as it gives specific properties related to orientation in space. So if we actually want to understand the origin of this inertia tensor, we have to look at the expression of the angular momentum. The angular momentum and at the opposite of the linear momentum has to be expressed with respect to a position in space. So we consider an arbitrary position P0 and we note R of Pi is equal to Pi minus P0 being the relative vector between a point of the shape and P0. Then the angular momentum in all its generality is L as being given by the integral of the cross product between R and the local density of mass rho times r prime. Then we can extend the value of r prime as p prime plus omega cross r, and actually the first part at least sum up to zero around the center of mass. Then we end up with a triple cross product, r cross omega cross r, that we can actually rearrange in uh, using matrix operation as some integral times omega, which can be took out of the integral. And this integral part is actually what we call the inertia tensor. Another issue with inertia is that its coordinate depends on the current orientation of the shape. So it depends on time. But luckily we can show that we can express the inertia tensor in another frame using the change of coordinate r times the inertia times r transpose. So it means that we can compute the inertia of a shape once and for all at its initial step, we usually denote it as I0, and only adapts its coordinate to the current frame orientation at any time using this change of basis.
So, as a summary, some properties of the inertia tensor. We can express it as an integral over the coordinate of the shape. The inertia tensor is usually expressed at the center of mass P of the rigid body. The coordinates of the inertia matrix depend on the body orientation and so on the time, but we can compute once I0 in a rest position and update it using the current orientation of the shape as I is equals to R times I0 times R transpose. And there exists always a frame in which I is diagonal. These axes are called the principal axis of inertia of a given shape, and they can be computed as the eigenvector of the matrix I. Now let's look at the forces applied on the shape. If we look locally at every position of the shape, we can define local forces F of pi acting on each position pi in omega. So these forces, they have two resulting components on the integral view of the body. First, there is the net force F applied on the shape and F is equal to the integral of all the pi of F of pi. And this total net force induces change of linear momentum or velocity of the body and so displacement of its center of mass. And second, there is another quantity called the torque, tau, applied on the body. This torque induces a change of angular momentum or angular velocity, and so it induces spinning of the solid. And tau is equal to the integral of a pi of pi minus p cross f of pi, where p is the point of evaluation of the resulting torque. And in most situations, we evaluate the torque at the center of mass, as it is then independent of the total net force contribution and simplifies the future computations. And then we can now express the relation of the dynamics applied to these integral quantities. The first relation is similar to the particles. The net force F gives the change of linear momentum. So F of T is equals to P prime of T, which is M times V prime of T, where M is constant. The second is specific to rigid bodies and uh, states that the torque, tau, gives the change of angular momentum. So tau at time t is equal to the derivative of L, which is the inertia matrix times omega prime of t. And the global equation of motion involves now four quantities, the position, the linear momentum O, the orientation R, and the angular momentum L and relates to the derivatives. So the derivative of the position is its velocity, the derivative of the linear momentum is the net force, the derivative of the orientation is the angular velocity times the orientation matrix, and the derivative of the angular momentum is the total torque. So how can we solve that numerically? First, we set the initial condition. We know the position, the velocity, the orientation, and the angular velocity at time t0. And we can pre-compute the inertia tensor in this orientation I0. And then we have access to the initial angular momentum given as I0 times the angular velocity at time t0. Then we iterate over small time steps at time tk, and we can compute the total net force, f of tk, the torque, tau of tk, on the center of mass. Then we can compute the current inertia tensor in the current orientation. Then we can extract the current angular velocity as the inverse of the inertia tensor times the angular momentum. And then we perform the numerical integration in updating the state vector, position, linear velocity, rotation, and angular momentum. Note that the angular momentum in itself doesn't necessarily convey a very intuitive notion, but its values is carried through the relation in the system of equation during the integration, and we can extract from it the notion of angular velocity, which is more meaningful to represent. And very often, when we are speaking about the physics engine of a video game, this is really what it does. Physics engine are mostly focused on rigid bodies dynamics that is solved numerically and handle their collision. 
And here's a side note on the use of quaternions. Actually, I presented the version of the equation with the matrix formulation and the matrix derivative. But we could choose a different representation of rotation and typically express our formulation with quaternions instead. So a special concern with rotation matrix is that you are numerically integrating directly over the coefficient of a matrix, which lead to this iterative scheme when using an explicit numerical integration. And iterating over this formula will make your rotation matrix slightly diverging little by little from being a rotation. So using quaternions can improve the robustness of the integration. In this case, we have to express the derivative of the quaternion. And it turns out that Q prime of T is equals to one half of Q of omega of T times Q of T, with Q omega being omega of T zero, where omega is the angular velocity. So it's actually pretty convenient and it's rather similar to the matrix version, excepted that you have a 0.5 term that shouldn't be for yet. And to ensure that your quaternion continue to represent a rotation after the numerical integration, then you can renormalize it easily to make sure that it remains with unit norm. And the last point with rigid bodies is their collisions. Efficient and robust collision handling between rigid bodies is an entire problem in itself, in which an entire course could be dedicated, actually. So first, of course, we need to detect the geometrical intersection between shapes. This often ends up relying on geometrical computation with the help of acceleration structure in the broad phase followed by a narrow phase. Once we have detected the intersection, we need to model the dynamic response. One way to model such response is the use of something called the impulse that allows to model a sudden change of velocity. The impulse J in itself is the integral of a force over a short period of time. And the impulse can be interpreted as a force impulse and a torque impulse that will imply a sudden change of linear and angular momentum. So in the common case where we suppose that we have an elastic collision between solids, which means that the solids are bouncing on each other, there is a closed form solution of the impulse that takes into account the masses and inertia between the two shapes and the normal of the contact surface. Actually, here is the formulation and it's not trivial. And if you want to get more details, you can look at this SIGGRAPH course from 99 that details the, the rigid body's contact. And finally, rigid body's simulation is very standard. It's used in multiple applications, as in uh, visual effects for explosion. It's the basic of game simulation, like for cars, airplanes, and so on. Although the equation that I used and the resolution of the contact may be sometimes approximated in several frameworks. Implementing a rigid body simulation from scratch is not easy especially dealing with inertia and robust collision. And if you are interested in what exists, there is a kind of widely used library called Bullet Physics, which implements it and its use in multiple projects. This is, for instance, this library that is used in Blender to model the rigid body simulation. And now we are reaching our last model, which is the continuous material. This model allows to represent materials that deformed, and it's the most accurate representation of the real-world materials which always have deforming properties. But on the other hand, it's the most complex to deal with. So the interest of this model is that every part of the shape can be deformed, and we have local properties defined continuously on it. It's therefore adapted to model accurately elastic and viscoelastic shapes or fluids, for instance. Actually, there is two main representations of the deforming object. The first representation, and uh, most common to deal with, is the Lagrange representation. In this representation, we consider that each position or vertex of the shape is somehow attached to the shape with respect to some reference configuration. And we can therefore track this position as it moves a long time. We can also track its velocity, the force applied to it, and so on. All can be expressed with respect to the reference configuration. So this model is actually well adapted for shapes that deforms 
a little bit like elastic shapes, but doesn't change drastically compared to their original shape. This is however not the case for fluids. If you consider a fluid at a given time, its deformation implies very complex twists, changes of topology, and so on. So tracking the moving position on such model and compare them to their original configuration doesn't really make sense. So there is another configuration, which is the Euler representation. In Euler representation, we don't track a specific point attached to the shape, but we look on a fixed point in the 3D space what is the apparent velocity and apparent forces. And then the shape is evolved as a density which is advected along the velocity field which is defined in space. This representation is more adapted for elements such as fluids that are uniformly defined in space and can undergo very complex deformations. While these two representations lead to different formulations, They are actually similar, and the choice between Lagrange and Euler representation is up to us. Let's start with the Lagrangian description. In this representation, we always compare the deformed shape with respect to its initial configuration. So let us suppose we have a position capital P on the initial shape, and its image P in the deformed shape. Then we can define a deformation function phi, which is P is equal to phi applied to capital P. To have more information about how this deformation acts on the shape, we introduce the notion of deformation gradient F, which is basically the Jacobian matrix of the function phi. So the deformation gradient F of P is the partial derivative of phi with respect to the initial coordinates capital P. Or using a common abuse of notation, we also write that it's the differential of P with respect to capital P. This deformation gradient is a 3 by 3 matrix, and it characterizes the local deformation associated to phi. And typically, if we look at its action on a small vector element, so if we have a position P plus dP, it's mapping phi of capital P plus capital dP is approximately P plus F of capital P dP. So this deformation gradient will be an indication on how vectors, angles, and distances are going to be modified by the deformation. So when we are looking at the deformation of a continuous material under some effort, we are going to look at internal forces called stress and the action to the deformation of the shape called strain. This internal stress is causing a local deformation of the shape and not a global translation and rotation which are not, which are not related to material effort. So the idea of strain is to be able to have a quantitative measurement of the shape deformation but independently of the rigid transformation. So at first we could think to the deformation gradient F, but F encode both the rotation, which is not related to the effort, and any other local deformation inducing a change of length, and therefore related to the effort. Note that if phi is a rotation, actually F is the rotation matrix. And actually, there is several possible measurements of strain. There is not a unique formulation. The first one is called the green strain tensor. We call it epsilon equals 0.5 times f times f transpose minus identity. We can check that if phi is a rotation, then epsilon is equal to zero, which is what we expect. But the downside of this formulation is that it's not linear with respect to the coordinate of the shape P. Another formulation is the linearized Cauchy strain which is epsilon equals to 0.5 f transpose plus f minus identity. This corresponds actually to the approximation of the green strain tensor in the case of a small deformation. In this case, the formulation is linear with respect to p. But if f is a rotation that is far away from the identity, then the strain is not exactly zero anymore. 
which may lead to an incorrect measurement of the deformation. And the second element we already mentioned is the stress. So the stress, sigma, is actually a 3x3 three three matrix. Or it's also a tensor, actually. And it describes the internal forces per area unit induced by the local deformation in any direction. This can be actually seen as a generalization of a pressure along actually different direction. And sigma ij is therefore the eighth component of this force, acting with respect to the jth component of the direction. So the relation between this stress and the strain is an internal characteristic of the material which is called the constitutive relation of the material. One of the simplest constitutive relations is to suppose that there is a linear relation between stress and strain. And then we can write that sigma ij is equal to the sum over some indices k and l of some constant c i j k l times epsilon k l. This constant c is called the stiffness tensor. As we are dealing with products between tensors, there is a lot of coefficients involved. And in its general form, C has 81 coefficients. So this is already a large number of degrees of freedom for the simple linear constitutive relation. We can also associate the strain energy or the elastic potential energy, which is a generalization of the potential energy of particles, as u is equal to 0.5, the sum of over all the indices i, j, k, and l of sigma i, j times epsilon k, l. And if you express it from the strain, this is one half of the sum of the stiffness times the square of the deformation as tensor product. But it can be seen as the generalization of the potential energy of a spring that would be one half of some of the stiffness times the elongation squared. We can also note some specific cases. If we have a homogeneous isotropic elastic material, this expression can be highly simplified as there is no dependence to the directions. And we can express the relation between stress and strain using the so-called Lamé parameters that can also be related to the Young modulus and Poisson, and Poisson ratio, which are commonly used to describe more intuitively the behavior of materials. So the Young modulus is the elongation of the material with respect to the force exerted in this direction, while the Poisson ratio characterizes the compression of the material in one direction when extended in the orthogonal one. And we can, in all its generality, express the evolution equation of a continuous material. One relation is to simply apply relation on the linear momentum. So the change of linear momentum is equal to the sum of, of all external forces plus the traction exerted on the boundary of the shape. Basically, this traction is the result of all the stressed but applied to the boundary. The change of linear momentum is the integral over the shape of its density of mass times the second derivative of the position, assuming a constant density along time. The sum of the external forces is simply the integral over all the local forces applied at each point of the shape. And the traction is the integral of the stress to the surface normal and integrated over the boundary of the shape. As we can see, we have a mix of volume integral and surface integral. So one way to pass everything under a common volume integral is to use the divergence theorem and therefore the contribution of the traction on the boundary can also is be expressed as the integral over the volume of the divergence of the stress. And as this relation is satisfied at every position of the volume, we can represent it in its local form. And for each point P of the shape, we have the local density rho times the second derivative of P is equal to the force F plus the divergence of the stress. And this relation is actually extremely general and covers all types of deformation, 
We also have to pay attention at the divergence of sigma. Sigma is actually a tensor. So its divergence is the generalization of the common formulation, giving actually a vector with three components. Now that we saw the formulation with Lagrange relation, we can also do the same process with the Euler formulation. So in Euler formulation, we have quantities expressed at fixed position in 3D space. So the deformation is described by the velocity u of p and t, where p is some fixed coordinate x, y, and z, and does not depend on time. Using the velocity u at specific position, we don't need to rely on a global deformation depending on the reference shape anymore. So one thing we change with Euler formulation is that the velocity is not a function of space and time, and not only of a function of time attached to a given position, but is displaced with the deformation. So when we want to express the acceleration, we will have to express the differential of u with respect to a small time variation dt. And this differential of u with respect to t has to be expressed as the differential of a function with multiple parameters. So in this case, we have the differential of u with respect to time, which is equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to time, plus the sum of all the coordinates of the partial derivative of u with respect to the coordinates, time dpi divided by dt. And this term dpi divided by dt is actually the velocity itself. So rearranging the terms, we end up with the partial derivative of u in time, plus the scalar product between u and the operator nabla applied to the velocity u. This relation is actually called the material derivative, and the first part is simply the temporal variation at a fixed position, and the second term is the advection term. It expresses the displacement of the velocity, which is due to its own motion in space. So similarly to the Lagrangian formulation, we can express a notion of stress and strain. The stress is this time called the stress rate tensor, as it expresses the change of deformation in a neighborhood of a fixed point, and it's expressed relatively to the velocity u. And there is the strain rate tensor sigma, which expresses the rate of change of the deformation in a neighborhood of a fixed point. And we can express the equation of motion. The principle is totally similar to what we did with Lagrangian representation. We have rho du divided by dt is equal to the force plus the divergence of sigma. When we expand the differential of u, we have the advective term u dot nabla applied to u. Now let's suppose that we have only the weights applied as an external force then f is equal to rho times j. And we can also decompose the stress as a viscous and pressure component. The pressure component is a stress applied along the normal of the surface element, and we can express sigma pressure as minus p times identity, where p is actually the common notion of scalar pressure. And the viscous component is the stress applied in the other directions. Splitting this stress along these two components and noting that the divergence of p times identity is actually the gradient of p leads to the relation stating that rho times the derivative of u with respect to t is equal to rho times j minus rho times the advection term minus the gradient of the pressure plus the divergence of sigma viscous. So this relation is an intermediate, very general formulation for fluid motion under its own weight. And we can actually go into some more special cases. If we assume further that the fluid is an isotropic Newtonian fluid, it means that there is a linear and a scalar relation between the strain rate epsilon and the stress rate sigma viscous. And we can write by convention, sigma viscous is equal to 2 times mu times epsilon, and we can call mu the viscosity parameter. Furthermore, we can assume an incompressible fluid 
which is characterized by divergence of u is equal to zero. And then we can work further with this equation, expanding the divergence of the terms. We can note several identities and using the incompressibility condition, we have the term div of nabla of u transpose, which is equal to zero. And the second term, div of nabla of u, which is actually the Laplacian of u. Finally, we can set the value eta as being equal to mu divided by rho, and we end up with this formulation. The derivative of u with respect to t is equal to j minus u dot nabla applied to u minus 1 divided by rho times the gradient of the pressure plus eta times the Laplacian of u. And this formulation is the very common Navier-Stokes equation that we actually derived from the very general form of motion equation, assuming an incompressible Newtonian fluid. And as a last point in continuous representation, we end up with partial differential equation. In general, we don't have explicit solution, and we need to rely on an approximated numerical solution. There is mostly two main ways to go for the discretization. First, the use of finite differences, and in this case, we discretize the space on a grid of steps dx and time dt, and we use the numerical approximation of derivatives using mask in space and time. It's very general and usually quite simple to set up. It usually works well when your material can be described with a rectangular grid, and it's therefore adapted to the Eulerian description. However, if you have a shape with more complex boundaries, then these approaches can become quickly complex. And these methods, they are quickly subject to instabilities when applied in numerical solution. So the other range of approach is the use of finite element method, or FEM. In this method, the shape is discretized into simple elements, and then we build a continuous function on each element, interpolating the values at the node. In computer graphics, elements are often tetrahedrons in volume, and we use linear function to interpolate the values, as is the simplest and more efficient model. Once this representation is set, the partial differential equation can be integrated over each element, and this gives a relation called the weak form of the PD. The advantage of this form is that it can be expressed as a linear system, if the PD is linear, linking the values at, at the nodes element. So the main advantage of finite element method is that it can handle curved boundaries and it's typically used to follow deforming solids. And finite element method has been widely studied in mechanical engineering and there is strong guarantees on its accuracy. On the downside, the method is much more complex to set up. It needs to express, we need to express the elements, the weak formulation, to express the linear system, and it's quite computationally expensive as it requires to solve a large, usually sparse, system of equations. Also, the solution converge well when the meshing of the elements is good, but when there is a very elongated tetrahedron, for instance, then the solution can quickly diverge. And I'm definitely not going into the details. This is only a very brief introduction, as the use and study of finite element method is also a very complex subject that is the object of dedicated courses that we won't have time to cover.